Welcome, everyone. This is the Red Hat Enterprise Linux Roadmap Session. Glad you could join us. Uh, we've got an action-packed agenda, so let's just jump right in, because we've got a lot of material to cover. There's, first, we'll start at some of the objectives that we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, first, I'm going to do an introduction to get the thing rolling. One of the things I'm going to start with is a very brief outline of our, our life cycle, primarily to pu put the releases into context, to give the idea of how much uh, innovation and how much development is going on in each of the different releases. Um, as part of this presentation, it's, we've got uh, a whole host of our uh, main development managers who are here with us. And rather than have me trying to machine gun out 100 slides at you guys, uh, we're going to do it together. We can, maybe we can do 200 slides that way. And, but you're going to hear it straight from the horse's mouth, what they think of some of the key uh, you know, points that they're delivering. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that we are passing out a handout. Uh, Paul Friels, raise your hand in the middle aisle there. He's uh, helping to hand these out. They were available as you walked in the door. Probably a few people noticed. So Paul's handing them out. And this handout, it, it mainly just contains some references. Specifically, as we go through the presentation, we're pointing out some other sessions that you can go to to have more uh, drill down detail. So rather than having everyone trying to frantically scramble notes for that, we've got that right in the handout. And we've also got some other uh, pointers to some interesting online links and things like that to get more information. So please do check that out as we go through this. Um, also, another point here is to really get you to, to meet the team, meet some of the managers. I'll introduce them momentarily, and to really just put a face behind the product. And uh, other thing that's most important, every year when we put this presentation together, we struggle with what's the best way to do it, you know, because like a million things we could talk about, every one of these little segments could be a two-hour presentation of its own. And so every year, based on the feedback that you guys provide, we have adapted and changed the presentation to try to make it the most effective. So I, we really are welcoming of your input, both on you should have got like a handout when you walked in the door, the yellow sheet to give your feedback. Let us know, you know, right in the comment fields, if there's ways that you thought it could be improved. We're all ears. We really listen to that. Uh, last thing, the lawyers made me put this in. Uh, any mention of future releases means we're not on the hook for anything. Uh, and also, uh, we're only, because we have a very limited amount of time, we're only describing the tip of the iceberg, some of the highlights of our features. There's, there's way more involved with that. So let's just jump in with uh, some quick introductions. Oh, the last thing, as a housekeeping measure, this is a two-hour session. And, but we will be respecting the intermission. So we're going to do, it's going to be uh, presented in two halves. They're not duplicates, so we're going to go through the first half. There'll be a 10 minute break. We get a lot of material, so we're going to promptly start up uh, the 10 minutes after that. So feel, hope you, uh, I hope there's still some people left for the second half. So quick introductions. Dorla Orr, managing our virtualization team from Israel. Linda Wang, who does our kernel generalist, which is a lot of networking, VM process management. Peter Monticelli leads our hardware enablement platform team. Tom Coughlin does storage and volume management. And Rick Wheeler does our file system and, and Gluster capabilities. And you'll be hearing from all of them. So with that, uh, just some key introductory themes. First of all, the work that we're doing in RHEL, we are viewing, uh, we're trying to enable our customers to seamlessly go from bare metal to virtualized deployments to hybrid cloud deployments as well. So virtualization and cloud, for what we do, it's not an afterthought. It's not a second team. It's not a layered product. It's part and parcel with all we do. So as we add uh, virtual memory features, as we add uh, resource controls, they are really focused not just for bare metal, but also for um, cloud and virtualization environments too. Now, this, I only have one slide on the life cycle, so don't worry, this won't put it all to sleep. Uh, just to give you the context, we, our releases are typically 10-year life cycles, and the first phase um, is uh, uh, the first uh, three and a half to four year, over four years. It's the full support. It's where we're doing full enablement, new hardware, new features of various kinds. And we can see that at this point in time that um, RHEL 5 and RHEL 6 are, you know, remain in, this, in the full life cycle. And we'll have a slide that drills down in the next one. After that, the initial full development phase, we go into a transition phase, which lasts typically about a year or so. And that's what we call production phase two, where we do our final uh, smaller features, final feature enhancements, but mostly bug fixes based on uh, the priorities from customer support. 
And then the last phase, production phase three, that is uh, just bug fix only, no new features. So it's the maintenance phase, really. And so you can see, for example, that um, RHEL 4 is uh, well into its uh, production three phase three phase. And we also have an optional three-year extension called uh, Extended Lifecycle Support ELS, where you can get even longer periods than the, the standard base. So let me just quickly say w one slide for each release. Where, where, what's the status of each release? RHEL 5, we are concluding production phase one with the release of RHEL 5.9. 5.9 will be the, the next release coming out in the RHEL 5 series. There, RHEL 5.9 includes hardware enablement for a lot of the new hardware platforms coming out from the, the major OEMs. And there are a uh, limited number of feature enhancements because we, we phase down the rate of feature innovation and change in each release as it gets later into its maturity cycle. But a lot of the work and feature enhancements that we're doing in RHEL 5.9 are for things like enablers for Red Hat Enterprise virtualization and other uh, management and things like subscription management and the like to be able to have consistent means of management across all our three releases. That's one of the key themes that you'll see. And as we uh, complete 5.9, we'll get into later 5.10, and that will put the release into its production phase two. Key takeaway I want to give on RHEL 5, it's a mature, stable release. We're doing minor feature enhancement and hardware enablement. But the key takeaway is that there still remain 4.5 years that you can run RHEL 5. So RHEL 5 isn't going away anytime soon. For RHEL 6, it's very active in its uh, development phase one, production phase one. Just last week, we shipped uh, RHEL 6.3. And RHEL 6.3 ranks among the, the, among the largest RHEL re update releases that we've ever done. Thousands of bugs and features included in it hundreds of packaged uh, updates, so it's really a fully large-scale release. Um, and so it's, RHEL 6 is really in the heat of development, highly active uh, development going on. We do a lot of hardware platform enablement. Uh, Peter Malicelli will get into that in great detail. Also, we've done a lot of scalability, uh, cloud and virtualization enhancements in the storage layers, and so you'll hear much more details about that. And we also knew... Uh, in the RHEL 6 lineup, we announced yesterday a developer tool chain, um, uh, which is new versions of compilers, debuggers, runtime libraries, and you'll hear about that in one of the segments here. Another key theme in RHEL 6 is we increasingly work on government certifications. This is increasingly more stringent, harder, and broader levels of government certification that enable it to be sold uh, you know, as required by higher levels of, of government agencies, things like security agencies and the like. And while not everybody here may be a, a federal security gook, a lot of our other customers draft off of that. They say, hey, if this is good enough for the three-letter agencies, then, you know, it, 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 it's good enough for them as well. RHEL 7. Uh, we, one of the, some of the key themes for RHEL 7 are going to be data center operational efficiency. So it's how do we enable our customers to more effectively utilize uh, larger scale hardware, uh, more inc increasingly complex topologies of hardware and the like. It's also how to make it easier to do uh, broader user management, identity management, uh, virtualization, configuration, and provisioning. So you'll see a lot of those themes uh, percolate throughout the rest of these uh, discussions. And we also, within every major release, we have uh, new tools updates, new developer tools, new debugging tools. And some of the things in RHEL 7 include trying to make these tools uh, work better in virtualization and cloud deployments. How do you have better visibility, for example, into profiling workloads and applications in a cloud environment? to be able to bring parity and, and, you know, to be able to introspect inside of a virtualized guest to see what's going on in that. The status of RHEL 7 is we are, we have completed our product planning. So our product managers, our support team, our uh, technical account managers, we have done a lot of outreach to our customer base. Another thing is we've had on our uh, customer portal, I should say the award-winning customer portal, if, my, if Marco's here, uh, we have had done a lot of surveys and inputs from our customers. All these have fed in. We've, we did uh, exhaustive prioritization, looking for common patterns and trends. We've completed the planning phase, and we are now very actively in the development phase. So we're in the do it phase. And we're gonna, you'll see some highlights of what's coming down the road. 
the way we do our development is we work in the, our upstream communities, the upstream kernel, upstream GNOME, upstream KVM communities and the like. We're implementing our features there. And the first preview, if you will, of RHEL 7 is a lot of the features have first appeared in Fedora 17, which shipped uh, about three weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. And so now we continue this active development in Fedora 18. So if you want even more glimpse, exposure, preview for what's coming up in RHEL 7, uh, just check it out in Fedora 18. But don't just check it out. Uh, give us feedback. Submit your bugs. or, or We accept patches, too. So we, this is the, the cool thing about community-led innovation. As far as the schedules for RHEL 7 are concerned, uh, the first public beta for RHEL 7 will be in the first half of calendar year 2013. So it's not too far away when RHEL 7 will be coming out. We don't have the specific uh, public availability schedule beyond that, but the point is that it, it's coming soon. So with that, uh, I've got my gong here that I'm out of time, and we're going to be jumping right over. So next up is Dor who's our uh, lead manager for virtualization. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dola O. I'm running virtualization under uh, the RHEL organization. Um, I'm a senior engineer manager. So before we start, I would like to ask you how many of you uh, uh, used uh, KVM hypervisor? Wow. Uh, I actually didn't expect it to do that many hands. And how many? are using VMware. OK, Less. so uh, <laughs> let, let's see what uh, 2013 will uh, turn out. And I hope to get you enough ammunition to go back to your companies and uh, to uh, convince all of the uh, uh, leading to uh, move to, the, uh, to a better hypervisor, I would say. So. Um, Derail OS is an OS that comes up with an embedded hypervisor within, and KVM is a hypervisor that has an OS. There's two aspects for uh, KVM has an OS. It's part of the uh, Linux kernel in the host side and uh, gets tons of uh, improvements out of the box, like uh, hardware enablement. We get that for free. All of the new CPUs from Intel and AMD, all of the new driver, everything, we get it. And, uh, my team is actually not even exposed to most of the stuff in the driver space. In the CPU, we, we are. We get uh, top-notch memory scheduler, memory management. We get uh, scalable scheduler. We get flexible iOS stack that sometimes I, I'm not even in the details of how many uh, possibilities there are to run KVM with and to attach uh, this type of networking and that type of uh, block devices. Uh, another uh, main theme of KVM that has an OS with is that we control the guest OS and we can come up with out-of-the-box experience as well as very optimized behavior that others uh, can't deliver, like VMware, for instance. Only us and Microsoft can do things like this, and we're open, and we have better performance and actually better feature state, I must say. So... The major theme that we're looking at while we're developing the hypervisor and the OS uh, is to run mission-critical applications. So we need to deliver scalability. And I'm happy to say that uh, with the upcoming RHEL 6.3 release, we, we ship the largest x86 guest ever. That's a huge achievement. Uh, in terms of performance, we win the industry uh, official benchmark, which is SpecVert. I'll cover it soon. And we have plenty of other performance wins. In terms of feature set, we try to get to care for reliability, availability, and plenty others. Uh, it's not just uh, pure performance. We're trying to deliver a better characteristic to your applications. And actually, it's many times it can be better uh, behavior in a virtualized environment where you, can, you could do a live migration and any type of hot plug that you can pick. Uh, maintenance is not neglected, and of course, we uh, supported the hypervisor and the OS for 10 years, but beyond that, we have uh, an application binary interface, and we support that for 10 years. We support uh, migration from older hypervisors like Xen and uh, VMware, and plenty of others, and we have a undisputed undis uh, devotion for stability. We uh, hypervisors is a mission-critical component. Um, 
we have the exceptional features that allows uh, only because we control both the guests and the host, and I'll expand furthermore. And we have uh, enterprise feature set and enterprise and cloud deployment. We have specifically uh, in security enhancements for the enterprise and for the cloud to run these workloads. So I'll be uh, touching a bit in each area, but it's just a, a glimpse and uh, more details will be uh, be able to be provided uh, later on today on uh, a demo that we do on KVM on the Partner Pavilion and to more on the uh, KVM specific session. Um, so in terms of scalability, uh, we get up to 160 virtual CPU per guest. That's a lot. Does somebody know the VMware limit? 16? Oh, they're better than that. They do 32. <laughs> uh, we go up to two terabytes of RAM. Again, a huge amount. Uh, we can uh, attach up to thousands of uh, block devices per single guest using our new backend, the virtual uh, SCSI. And there are plenty more. Uh, a breakthrough that we deliver. I, I won't go into cover each, but uh, we take special care to uh, scalability so you'll be able to work any workload with virtualization. And it also means that even if you run a plain one socket, two socket server, the overhead that KVM has is the minimal possible. In terms of performance, <clears throat> uh, maybe you've seen too much of the, this graph that shows the uh, KVM results, the KVM is in red, the VMware are in uh, green, and we hold the seven top most performance in, uh, in this benchmark. It's a benchmark that VMware designed, and we weren't part of it, and we even didn't ship the, uh, uh, those benchmarks were running by IBM and HP. We weren't involved much. Uh, our performance team helped, but as an advisor. My sources tell me that tomorrow, someone will reveal another world record breakthrough in terms of performance that KVM is able to deliver, but we'll uh, keep the details for tomorrow uh, and we'll be able to get a more drill down there. Um, besides just numbers, let's talk about a bit, a bit of, of features that are about in the following releases, we'll have dozens of uh, performance optimization, but um, nice thing that's worth to, uh, to mention right now is out-of-the-box uh, memory optimization for NUMA, non-unified memory access. So uh, we'll deliver it uh, out-of-the-box. It comes up with a user space daemon called NUMA-D, uh, starting with uh, RHEL 6.3 as a tech preview. And in RHEL 7, uh, we'll uh, replace that by two completing solution, AutoNUMA and SCHEDUMA in the kernel level. That these will be major optimizations. Uh, today it's possible to get to the, this level of performance, but uh, one will require to do pinning, and this will, uh, through these, you'll be able to come to, to get out of the box performance. Um, more around networking, we're going to have multi queue virtual NIC. So the, the virtual NIC that the VM has, uh, the, the virtual NIC that VM has will have multi queues and not just single queue and you'll be able to exploit all of the cores. Uh, zero copy will also reduce the overhead of uh, uh, virtualization. Uh, the, the new block layer is uh, very good for performance and there are a handful of power virtualization optimization that I'll cover in the other session. Um, for mission critical apps, we hope to get the best so your virtual machine will keep on running no matter the changes that you're going to uh, do for it. So you, you'll be able to do vCPU hot plug starting in 6R3 and memory hot plug in RHEL 7. It's joined the other hot plug support that we already have with hot plug NIC and hot plug block. Uh, there'll be live block operations like live snapshot and live block migration that are shipped together with Rev based on RHEL 6R3. And there are plenty more interesting stuff, uh, much, much more that can't, I can't cover right now. Um, so we, we've, I've spoken about uh, unique advantages of us that control the host and the guest together. Uh, it's two folds. One is uh, allows sophisticated operations like uh, 
uh, out of the box guest to host channel. We have it from uh, day zero, while VMware, they do have it, but only now they try to merge it back to the Linux kernel. Uh, guest agent, power virtualized clock, and very sophisticated one, and there are performance aspects that allow us to do power virtualized interrupts and do better than the uh, traditional uh, hardware x86 controller. There are a handful of others like page faults and spin locks, power virtual spin locks, but uh, time is running out. Uh, in terms of deployment, uh, KVM by now is uh, used massively by lots of enterprises. It's a key solution, and there are plenty of cloud solutions also, like the IBM Cloud, NTT Cloud, OpenStack speaks KVM as the default hypervisor, and of course, Overt with the upscaled uh, Overt release, the, the Rev release, uh, allows to uh, exploit all of the features by the, Rev, by the KVM hypervisor. So uh, to summarize, I invite you to uh, the other session, the KVM specific ones, and there are plenty others uh, Rev sessions. And for resources to browse offline, you can uh, check out the REL virtualization guide. We have three guides. In the past, we had one. There are lots of uh, reference architecture, how to move away from VMware to KVM, and plenty more. And there is a very interesting uh, Twitter channel, not just uh, uh, PR for the summit, but it's uh, a live Twitter channel that always brings you the latest news, and uh, I love uh, to be tuned to that. So thank you very much, and uh, hope to see plenty of uh, KVM users uh, next year. Hi, my name is Linda Wang. Uh, I'm the Senior Software Engineering Manager for Core Kernel for the Red Hat Inter Enterprise Linux. Uh, Enterprise. Um, today I'm going to highlight some of the core kernel features and enhancement we've been working on for the past year and also the next release. And I'm going to cover uh, virtual memory scheduler, um, resource management including Linux container, control groups, namespace, um, some of the new feature we added to networking as well as the debugging mechanism. In virtual memory space, um, in, or, in order to help uh, system administrator to better manage their systems, so in RALF 6.2 timeframe, we introduced two tunable parameters. First one is called OOM score ADJ for adjust. It is to improve the out of memory heuristics to allow system administrator to set the OOM score for a particular process. So if you set the OOM score to 1000, it marks that process to be the primary target to be killed under the OOM condition. If you set the process to be um, negative 1000 for the OOM score, then it marks that process to be the lowest priority to be killed under the out, under the out of memory condition. The next uh, tunable parameter we introduce is called SMAPS. It is extension to maps file. It allows um, the uh, it shows the memory usage of the process uh, for different parts of the section. In, for example, it will show the different memory usage for the library, also as well as the LDSO, which is the loader, heap, and stack, and so on. In addition, in 6.2, we extended the M remap, M in core, and protect system call to transparent huge page. As you recall, in the 6.0 timeframe, we introduced a transparent huge page to RHEL. And it basically allows the system to break down a large page size into a small page dynamically and transparently. As far as in the, in the uh, scalability improvements, as the number of core count increases in the processor nodes, and as the memory architecture moving toward NUMA aware, we added the two uh, couple more features into the RHEL 6.3. First one we added is the uh, cross memory at attach feature. It helps improve the inter-process communication of the process on two different cores on the same processor. In addition, we added the NUMA D support. That's actually a, a D, NUMA daemon running in user space. It allows the process to be, um, the allocated memories for that process to be, a, be closely related to the processor that's the process running on. That's actually technology preview in 6.3. In addition, um, we're looking at to make that, because NumaD is a um, user space application and you can set it in user space, um, you, have to you have to manually set them. So what we wanted to do is make that 
memory and the processor association closer and automatic. So we're currently um, looking at implementing um, two of the features to make that happen. One is the, called AutoNuma, the other one is SCATNUMA. Next, we're going to talk about um, scheduler improvements that we're working on. Um, in RHEL 6.3 timeframe, we backport the various CPU scheduler changes to prevent system deadlock or delay when moving tasks or process between control groups. In addition to that, uh, in RHEL 6.2 timeframe, we also added periodic updates to maintain the accurate share values for those long-running tasks that do not block. And for that, we actually help provide a fair and balanced CPU usage between the long-running tasks that do block and the long-running tasks that do not block. So for tomorrow, um, around 2.30 times, um, there is a performance analysis and tuning session by Shaq and Larry Woodman. So feel free to attend that one. That one gives you more in, um, information about performance improvement that we have made. Next, I'm going to talk about resource management improvements. What we're trying to do is include um, Linux container, also known as LXC. Linux container contains two parts. One's called namespace, the other one's control group. Namespace, what we're trying to do is to do tighter integration with security features. In RHEL 6 timeframe, namespace is going to stay technology preview. In RHEL 7 timeframe, we're going to aim full support with Linux container. As for Linux container, we're focusing on needed SE Linux policy and other security related features improvements to make it more secure. And as for, and also we're trying to do more, um, gather more user experiences and feedback to make Linux con container more useful. So there's a couple sessions related to Linux container and control groups. One's tomorrow at 1.20. It's made, uh, it's made presented by Dan Walsh. It talks about how Linux container and control group it works in a virtualized environment. And the next one is tomorrow at 2.30, which is by M Mike McGrath, that talks about how Linux container can be used in the um, cloud environment. So next, since I mentioned just now, Linux container controls um, provides namespace and control group. So control group is what we presented to you back in RHEL 6 timeframe. And in RHEL 6.1, we introduced the maximum bandwidth control for block I.O. In RHEL 6.2, we introduced the maximum bandwidth control for CPU control group, which is a scheduler control group. And at the same time, we also increased the number of CPU C group control, uh, CPU supported, control group supported to 128. At RHEL 6.3 timeframe, we introduced the priority networking C group, which allows you to set priorities to the process inside a networking C group. In RHEL 7, we're going to continue to support all these control groups as well, and as well as enhancing them. And tomorrow, about uh, 11 to 6 o'clock, we're going to be, my team and, my, and some of the developers for the control groups will be at the Partner Pavilion in the RHEL booth, so feel free to stop by. And we'll, give, we'll try to show you some of the C group demos. Next, I'm going to talk about core networking features that we've been working on. Also, again, to, to help a system administrator to better manage um, networking and traffic shaping in RHEL 5.9 timeframe, we added a TCP user timeout socket option. What it does is it allows the application to set its own timeout value. If, you, if an application sets a timeout value to be larger, then the application will be blocked on um, waiting for acknowledging for send data. If the timeout is being smaller, then the application will timeout sooner. Another one we've been um, introduced is a call IP set. IP set is actually a new package in RHEL 6.3 timeframe and also a new command. What it does is it stores the IP addresses and the port into a set and it matches to an IP rule, set of IP rules, IP table rules. And what it also allows you to do is dynamically update the IP, IP sets and information in that and you don't have to actually update the IP table rules. Also, we improved the scalability and performance enhancement as well in RHEL 6.3 timeframe. We actually introduced three different queuing mechanisms, um, scheduling mechanism disciplines into the networking. The first one we added is the quick fair queuing scheduling discipline for the packet to provide tight services for guarantee with low per packet costs. That's actually technology preview in 6.3. 
We also introduced MQ, MQ prior module for multi-queuing priority support. This schedule exposed an, the underlying traffic class and allow users to configure and map socket priority to a traffic class. The last one we introduced is IPMR module. This is to support multiple independent multicast IP routing table instances. What we're also focusing on for RHEL 7 timeframe is to improve networking um, in interface aggregation for better manageability and stability. We're going to introduce team driver and lib team support. Lastly is a kernel debugging mechanism I'm going to cover today. Um, in RHEL 6.2 and 6.3 timeframe, we have updated perf and perf tool and also old profile to the latest x86-64 chipset support. In addition, in 6.2 timeframe, we also added Python perf packages to allow um, anyone to actually write Python script against the perf interface. For, as for tracing in RHEL 6.2 and 6.3 timeframe, we also added the uh, networking UDB trace point as well as journaling file system for JDB2 and also the signal for core kernel. In addition, um, in RHEL 7 timeframe, we're looking at um, improving the EDAC, which is error detection and correction mechanism, by improving uh, the, some of the data error receiving and some of the um, report, error reporting mechanism. So we're going to introduce something called, and we're working on currently, on called hardware error reporting mechanism called HERM. It, we're looking at adding some of the support for reporting API events. Um, and also looking at some streamlining some of the reporting mechanism. Lastly, uh, we're going to look at the KZ KDOM supportability. In RHEL 6.0, we KZ KDOM added the XO, uh, extended for XFS and ButterFS file system support. And in 6.3 timeframe, what we're trying to do is to make it more supported, uh, mass, more, more system to get supported. So we end up um, lowering the threshold from four gigabyte to two, two gigabyte to enable more systems. That allows, um, that means like any system with two gigabyte memory in it will have KZ KDOM enabled by default. In addition, we're gonna continue adding um, device target support for um, RHEL 6 timeframe, we also added 6 to 3 timeframe, we added iSCSI VLAN over tagging and bonding. And in RHEL 7 timeframe, we're going to add the, uh, looking at adding multipath and FCE target support. So this is, actually, this is just um, some of the highlighted features we're looking at, we've been working on last year, and we've been looking to work on the next, next release. So, thank you. Hello everybody, Peter Marticelli, one of the kernel managers at Red Hat, uh, mainly dealing with hardware enablement. All right, so today we'll talk about RHEL 5, 6, and 7. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about ARM, we'll have a slide on power management, and we'll have another slide wrapping it up on InfiniBand. So first things first, RHEL 5, um, 5.9, as you heard from Tim, all right, we'll be extending support, so we're doing active development in it. Uh, you'll be looking for uh, additional hardware platform support for IB Bridge EX. That's the high-end IB Bridge platform, all right, and the new microarchitecture Haswell. And let's see, along with Haswell, obviously you have chipset support, so the PCH will be supported as well. And this is a note for, for RHEL 5, all right. When we talk about hardware enablement in RHEL 5, we're really talking about limited hardware enablement, all right. If you're looking for high-end RAS features, MCE, MC, uh, MCA, MCE log, all right? You'll be looking at RHEL 6 and RHEL 7 to obtain those features. All right, RHEL 6. It's kind of a crowded slide, a lot of development going on here. So to back up in 6.1, all right, Sandy Bridge EP and EP4S, all right, the support there for that. Um, when Ivy Bridge is released, we have support for it in 6.2, all right? I don't have a time machine, I'm not going back in time, it's just that we work with Intel under NDA and we do early development, all right? So when, when you deploy and those systems become available, all right, things should just work on 6.2. Uh, along with that chipset, uh, the SAS control unit, all right, think um, MD Admin Software RAID, all right? That is there in 6.1 because it's part of Sandy Bridge. There are large updates in 6.2 and 6.3 and all that work is done with Intel. 
Um, it's done internally on the engineering teams and everything is, is pushed upstream. Uh, there is support for a Micron PCI-E, uh, a real SSD drive, all right? That's new, it's a new block driver that's coming out in 6.3. Uh, the next bullet is FCO, FCOE ease of use, all right? A lot of bug fixes uh, coming out of the team. Neil Horman did a lot of work there. Um, SOIRV support. Uh, this is the Mellanox Connect X 10 and 40 gigabit cards. We'll see a performance chart on, on that a bit later. Uh, that's also in 6.3. Uh, along with Ivy Bridge, there's a new RD RAND. You can use that as a source of entropy starting in, starting in 6.3. Um, there's uh, a new uh, HP platform, a Gemini Hyperscale, um, low power, center on based, um, center 10 based. And we're looking at 6.3, all right, TP for tech preview, all right. We have some additional work for PCI IDs, um, some additional work for a watchdog uh, driver. But you'll be looking at, at least if you have early access to that hardware, 6.3 will boot. You'll be able to run some tests. And then you can look at full support on 6.4. Um, in addition, um, Sandy Bridge, Ivy Bridge, so those have PCIe 3, Gen 3 buses. So we're looking at a lot of 40 gig um, card development. All right, Andy Gospodarek, one of the managers on the team, his team is responsible for all the networking, doing a lot of active development, working with vendors, and also in the, with the upstream community. Um, support plan for Intel Microarchitecture code name Ivy Bridge EX and Haswell. So again, the 5.9 work that'll also be available in 6.4. Rel 7. So Rel 7, uh, ACPI 5. So we're looking at Specific topics, all right, we don't implement all of ACPI 5 just like we don't implement all of AC, uh, ACPI 4, all right? We take a look at what's um, to our advantage, what the community is working on. So in essence, looking at uh, additional RAS features, specifically in terms of, of power savings. Uh, and again, we have um, support for Ivy Bridge EX and Haswell. Um, look for a lot of driver updates for SRIOV support working with our vendors on that. Um, in the kernel, going into bridging kernel and user space, so the new kernel print K, uh, system D journal, uh, system D in general, right, for a central hot plug uh, service manager. And system D, in essence, uh, has allowed this nice trend here when you look at rel 5, rel 6, and, and rel 7 as far as boot times, all right? And obviously, we normally talk about servers, all right? If you're in the lab, you'll probably appreciate the, the cycle time if you're working on them. But also in a laptop, if you would have an SSD, you'd be looking at a sub eight second uh, boot time. All right, a uh, slide about ARM. All right, so ARM in Red Hat. Right now it's in the Fedora community, all right? We're working with that community, leading the efforts. For F17, all right, 11,000 packages, all right? Five, uh, five ARM semiconductors in support, and that work has all been done the last six months, all right? So a lot of act, active development. Uh, there's a link to the um, beta, but that beta is now uh, GA, so you can definitely take a look at that. Um, the range of support, all right, from low end, you know, $35 toys, all right, up to high end servers, all right? Next bullet, it's not an ARM experience, it's a Red Hat, all right? What we're pointing out is that we're, we're using one code base, right, one kernel source code base to make this happen. We're dealing with configurations that we see, we see and utilize in a normal server environment. It's not, it's not scaled down. Um, we're looking at increasing uh, Java performance, and in essence, we're working with, with the community and others, all right, as we foster this uh, ecosystem. All right, power management. Um, HP ProLiant DL360, all right, this is one of the new HP Gen 8 platforms, one two socket, 2468 cores, all right, right in the middle of the bell curve, high volume server, all right. Looking at 5.8 results, all right. What do you, what do you get for in, in 5.8 for power savings? You're looking at deep, deep C state support, all right. As you go from five to six, you obviously maintain the deep C state support. But then you have a tickless kernel, so you have higher residency, right? So just by upgrading, if the machine's idle, right, the race to idle, it's going to save you 27%, all right? Did we strip down the system? 
put in, you know, replace rotating media with SSDs, disconnect the, the ENET. No, it's just a server. It's in our lab. Hook up a watt meter, see what it's taking for power. Boot 5.8, quiesce it. All right. Um, do the same thing on RHEL 6, compare the numbers. If you do this, you should get comparable numbers. All right. If you don't, take a look at PowerTop, see if there's a user space daemon or maybe a, a driver in polling mode that, in essence, is uh, waking up the CPUs. All right. Um, additional, as I talked about, ACPI 5.0. Uh, so we're looking at uh, memory power state table, MPST. All right, the ability to migrate a page, create regions, in essence, power down specific regions of memory for additional savings. So that's work that's coming up. Look for that to land as it develops upstream, and we'll see what it matches up against for RHEL 6 and RHEL 7. All right, last slide, uh, InfiniBand. So for RHEL 5, right, since we're giving RHEL 5 additional legs, right, we're doing one more additional OFED update. All right, there's the 1541 Ledford's working on that. Um, I'm working with that community for the last four or five years, um, the associated drivers, the Mellanox, IBEN, and Core, and look for the Chelsea and their iWarp counterparts to be updated as well. Um, transitioning from RHEL 5 to RHEL 6 and RHEL 7, all right, OFED, um, the ability of, of OFED to maintain code, all right, to not have projects dead end, all right. The team has worked with that community. In essence, it's all upstream now. So it's OFA, Open Fabrics Alliance. So look for that uh, where we're leading, and that's what we're presenting uh, to our users in, in RHEL 6 and RHEL 7. So this chart, uh, if you look at it, it's a function of milliseconds, so time versus message size and bytes. All right, compared to this is a 40 gig on a PCI 3.0 uh, bus. It's an Intel white box, uh, Sandy Bridge. You'll notice the, um, the belly of the curve, right? So lower is better, so about 0.05 milliseconds. So a nice, nice response. And depending on how you look at it against a 10 gig, it's 20% on up uh, for savings. 10 gig tends to drift, all right? If this interests you, uh, these are numbers out of the performance team, Doug Schachschober's group, and I'm sure they have presentations and, and other charts for people to take a look at, all right? I'm around today. I have 10 minutes to talk about you know, my team's work. <coughs> You know, in RHEL 6, you know, from 6.0 to 6.3, we just announced it. That's 15,000 plus changes, all right? Uh, it's a lot of work. Obviously, I can't cover all that. So if you have questions, come find me. All right, next up is Tom Coughlin. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. So I'll be speaking about what's coming and what's new in storage. And this is the level, the layers of the storage files uh, below the file system, and then my colleague Rick will cover the file system portion of storage. Sorry. So the general themes for today that I'll be talking about. First, we're continuing to put em equal emphasis on both scale up and scale out storage. And what that refers to in this context is continuing to support large RAID arrays in SAN shared storage environments where scaling up means faster speeds and feeds and, and um, larger RAID arrays. And scale out refers to being able to do an excellent job of supporting local storage in the, in the server box and then having many servers in a, in a distributed environment. So we cover both the local uh, storage as well as the um, SAN storage. Next theme overall in, is uh, interoperability. We continue to work with the hardware vendors and the, and, the o, and the OEMs to support all the various interconnects. More on that in the coming slides. Also, support within RHEL for um, acting as a storage server. So now um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux box can act as a target for FCOE as well as uh, for iSCSI. And manageability, storage management uh, is something that we're focusing on. Storage virtualization, referring here primarily to LVM, to allow you to do things like software RAID and snapshot and thin provisioning. And um, last on the slide here, a new M, uh, initiative to allow you to be able to manage your external storage from within the operating system. So be able to, and, and, and there's some slides on that coming up. So on the topic of storage interoperability, um, 
There's work in the uh, in, in RHEL 6.3 that you'll that coming out um, to support uh, fiber channel doubling the speed of fiber channel. Um, the addition of uh, brocade drivers. Brocade is getting into the storage market with fiber channel and FCOE uh, adapters. We've got drivers for those. You'll start to see OEM starting to ship that hardware and, and requiring those drivers. And then support as well for, um, as I mentioned, uh, new support for uh, FCOE as a storage server. We've had iSCSI target support for several years, now we're adding FCOE to the to the capability of, of RHEL as a storage server. On the topic of local storage, we have um, quite a bit of emphasis in RHEL 6 and and um, and RHEL 7 and RHEL 5 as well uh, to support uh, HBA RAID. This is um, products coming from from LSI and HP and. And Adaptec is new in this area, or newly uh, resurrected in this area, shipping uh, HBAs that do RAID in the firmware. Serial attached SCSI is, is going to be doubling the speed uh, that you'll start to see that hardware coming out in the RHEL 7 time frame. We'll have support for that in the operating system when it arrives. Performance um, requirements for um, PCI flash devices is starting to move the industry towards uh, some new standards. NVMe is one which allows you to get higher performance on the PCI bus when you're dealing with flash devices that are, that are uh, residing on the PCI uh, bus and acting as storage. Another standard in that area is the, is the new capability being worked on at the SCSI committee to allow you to run SCSI commands right over the PCI bus. So now you don't need a fiber channel or a, or a SAS or a SATA interconnect. You simply run SCSI commands straight over the PCI bus. These industry standards are, are making their way to the market. We're working with the hardware vendors uh, and, and incorporating these drivers into the operating system. <clears throat> so next, uh, the, the theme regarding uh, management of storage. Uh, the ability to virtualize storage, take all of your physical storage, put it into a volume group, has been there in, in Linux and RHEL for years. Now we're adding to that the capability to do RAID 4, 5, and 6 within LVM. So these higher level RAID uh, capabilities allow you to do redundancy with lower cost. You don't need to have twice as much storage to get full redundancy. We have in RHEL 6.3 uh, tech preview is the implementation of a LVM metadata daemon, which allows the operating system to track dynamically as devices come and go. We'll, we'll gather that metadata off of those devices so that when it comes time to execute an LVM command, we don't need to go and read the metadata. It's already been uh, dynamically gathered in as the devices come or, or as the devices leave. So a much more dynamic and much more timely um, execution of LVM commands with this new capability. Also a tech preview in RHEL 6.3 is the capability within LVM to do thin provisioning. So you may be familiar with thin provisioning on external RAID arrays where you can create a pool of storage and create a logical unit, a LUN, which uh, doesn't take any space until you actually write to it and then it consumes space from a pool. We now have that capability within LVM. You've got a volume group. You can create logical volumes which don't take any space until writes occur. Then they start to consume space from your thin pool. And, um, and then as discards occur, when you discard files or delete a file system, then we'll issue commands to free up space within that within that uh, thin pool. This is a tech preview. You can try it in 6.3, and we expect to see that coming into full support in future releases. <coughs> and then uh, also within, in the LVM space as a tech preview, in 6.3 we have LVM snapshots. So you're again familiar with the notion of RAID arrays providing the capability to take a snapshot which is an instantaneous copy, and then data is preserved as you do writes. You do a copy on write of the old data. 
This is something that is now available as a tech preview in, um, in LVM. You can create a, a snapshot logical volume of some existing logical volume, and um, that snapshot is immediately available. You can write to it if you, if you wish, and you can use that to roll back to the uh, original uh, state of the, uh, of the, of the uh, origin volume. The new implementation of snapshot, we, I, I should have said, we had snapshot in, in LVM for several years. The new implementation in 6.3 um, scales much better. Um, you can now have many snapshots of, a, of let's say, of like a, a golden image, many virtual machine copy of a golden image. When you make a change to that base image, only one copy on write is required, as opposed to the old style where you needed to copy uh, for each of your snapshots. Now you just need one copy on write operation. This will scale much better. And then recursive, a snapshot of a snapshot of a snapshot, again, when it comes time to do a read or a write, um, you don't need to do a recursive search through all those tables. Um, the, uh, the new implementation will go directly to that, to that data. So this again, tech preview. Um, give it a try in 6.3 and watch for it in future uh, releases. <clears throat> I mentioned we've got this new initiative, this lib storage management is a, is a project that, that Red Hat has initiated. It's an open source, vendor neutral um, API to allow you to manage your external storage. So within the operating system, there'll be an API as well as a CLI to create a LUN, um, take a snapshot, of a hardware snapshot. In other words, instruct the RAID array to take a snapshot of the device. You might be able to instruct the RAID array to take a copy, a full copy of the device, uh, or delete a LUN. And those sorts of operations that are very handy to be able to synchronize with what's going on in the operating system. You quiesce the database, you flush the writes, and you, take a, and you issue a command to cause the hardware to take a snapshot. So this is, again, a new feature. You can look for it on um, uh, SourceForge. And um, we're, we're looking forward to, to layering on top of this additional storage management capabilities in, in future releases. And I believe that. I've got some references there on your, on your sheet there. Um, and unfortunately, the lab that's mentioned there is happening right now. This is a, a lab for, uh, for um, uh, exploring new features in LVM. So that, that covers what I've got here. And now I can introduce Rick Wheeler to talk about the next level in the storage world, the file systems. I wasn't over time. <laughs>